think I read this somewhere, but I got the no, no, you know, bringer type thing. Oh, I see. These people are smoking. I see. Yes. I don't think yes. I understood that. I thought they were okay. Oh, they're going to love me. Well, I would imagine widespread. The engineers are trained. Oh my God. I'm doomed. Okay. Yeah. I'm not afraid of it. Something changed. Um, Jay Palmer, I don't know who that is. Yeah. Oh, all right. Okay. Bye. All right. If you could um, turn camera on and give us a little bit of audio, just to make sure we're you're coming through. We're not getting any audio from you. If you could just give us a little bit, Mr. Uh, Palmer. Can you hear us now? Yep, got you coming through. Did you just say a few more words just to make sure we're getting you? Testing one, two, three. Can you hear me? All right, thank you. You're welcome.
Good afternoon, and uh, thank you to everyone for attending this roundtable discussion today on rail safety. Our participants today include Mayor Frank Moran, the mayor of Hiram, Georgia, where three locomotives and eight freight cars derailed in November of 2021. Mr. Clarence Anthony, the executive director of the National League of Cities. Mr. Vince Verna, the Vice President and National Legislative Representative for the Brotherhood of Locomotive Engineers and Trainmen. Mr. Peter Kennedy, an International Representative for the Sheet Metal Air, Rail, and Transportation, or SMART Workers Mechanical Division. And Ana Savidos, a small business owner from East Palestine, Ohio whose business, businesses are located just down the tracks from where a Norfolk Southern train derailed last February. <laughs> Safety on the rails is something the majority didn't want to discuss when we had a hearing regarding grade crossings earlier this year. So I look at the uh, stakeholders here today at this event and I'm reminded of a story I read recently about a court battle with a small town in Texas and one of the class one railroads. This small town, Palestine, Texas, served as an important node on the Union Pacific Network. It was so important that the town was able to secure jobs for the community back in 1872. But with consolidation in the freight rail industry, Union Pacific has attempted to multiple, multiple times to get out of this 152-year-old agreement and close a rail car shop located in this town that employs over 100 people. That's 100 families in a town of 18,000 who would no longer have a stable job and would likely be forced either to find something else or move away. Coincidentally, this rail car shop in, East, in Palestine is one of the two car shops on the Union Pacific Railroad that perform heavy modifications and repairs to freight cars. The same types of modifications and repairs are needed to ensure freight cars on the tracks remain safe. Simply put, what we are seeing today in the freight rail industry is efforts to take shortcuts on labor, safety, and service, all in the pursuit of profits. While we, we, while we see bigger profits for the railroads, mm -hmm. meaning more dividends for shareholders, we see continued derailments and incidents every single day. I was pleased to see Secretary Buttigieg share some of the uh, very same concerns I have regarding rail safety in a letter sent by him to the Association of American Railroads earlier this week. Some of these concerns include efforts by AAR to derail the Railway Safety Act, failure by the Class One railroads to join the uh, confidential closed call reporting system and continued efforts to eliminate jobs by advocating for unproven automated track inspections. I hope our discussion today will show the disastrous consequences of actions taken by these railroads and the urgent need to ensure safety, not profits, drive the decisions made by the railroads. And I look forward to hearing from our participants. Uh, yeah, so now I will uh, hear from the uh, ranking member of the TNI overall committee, Mr. Larson. Thank you, Rick, uh, Ranking Member Payne, uh, for hosting the roundtable and for your continued work to improve rail safety. It's been more than 13 months since the Norfolk Southern derailment in East Palestine, Ohio. In that time, there have been more than 1,500 accidents. Some of these 1,500 rail accidents have resulted in serious injury or death of rail workers. 
a number have caused evacuations of entire towns. In my home state of Washington, in just the last five years, there were 193 train accidents, 71 grade crossing incidents, and 167 fatalities of people on the railroad right of way. New York Times recently reported there were more rail accidents in 2023 than in 2022. Safety in every mode of transportation, including rail, should always be the priority of the Transportation and Infrastructure Committee. Many Democrats have consistently asked for a hearing on rail safety in the wake of the Norfolk Southern derailment in East Palestine. Last May, every TNI Democrat signed a letter asking for a rail safety hearing to highlight existing rail safety recommendations from the National Transportation Safety Board. In January, NTSB Chair Jennifer Hamadi testified there are over 190 outstanding recommendations on rail safety that remain open from prior accidents and incidents. Although this subcommittee held a hearing, an important one, on grade crossings, there were several voices that were not present at that hearing. And today's roundtable is an opportunity to hear from people directly impacted by freight railroad safety, the women and men who maintain and operate trains, the communities that protect their citizens from derailments and the impacts of long trains, small business owners directly impacted by that derailment in East Palestine, Ohio, and subsequent cleanup. While the number of railroad accidents and incidents has been on the decline for the past 40 years, the rate of incidents per train miles traveled is on a troubling upward trend. So I look forward to hearing from our panelists about rail safety and learning what we can do to make freight rail safer. And with that, uh, Mr. Chairman, um, soon to, soon, hopefully soon to be Mr. Chairman, but currently ranking member, I'll turn it back over to you. Well, I appreciate that, sir, and back at you. Uh, uh, next, uh, we have um, the singers panel, as I stated, and um, we will um, hear from um, Mayor Frank Moran, who is um, uh, joining us today via, via video. M Mayor Moran? Yes, sir. If you have... Um, an opening statement? I do. Uh, you know, the city of Hiram, uh, we're a town of about 5,300 people, but this city was built around the rail system. And uh, the rail system here, the Norfolk Southern Line, runs directly through the center of our old downtown business district. In the area where we had the derailment uh, a, year, a couple of years ago, uh, it was right by our uh, business center in, in old downtown. But beyond that, when our citizens who live, everybody, everybody lives very close to the rail lines. And they were very concerned whether or not uh, they, would, they would have to evacuate. Was there any danger to the community? And uh, we weren't able to give them that uh, right away. And uh, I know that uh, there are some things that the, that the uh, rail line uh, can and cannot do, but I, I think they need to reevaluate some of this and how they notify uh, people, the jurisdictions that they're traveling through if they've got hazardous material on their uh, trains. Thank you. Uh, next, we will hear from Mr. Clarence Anthony, National League of Cities. I hate you. I'm not a member, so I'm learning. Um, Thank you all very much for having the National League of Cities here today to be a part of this round table. Uh, the last week we've had 3,000 delegates uh, and in the halls today they are around talking about this top priority, rail safety. As a matter of fact, this is so important that this became one of our priorities as we passed the resolution of our board of directors calling for Congress in a bar bipartisan manner to pass this rail safety bill. Uh, railroad tracks cross through thousands of our communities run, running right next to our main streets, homes, schools, as well as hospitals. While rail decisions are felt locally, they are primarily governed here in Washington, D.C. by Congress as an interstate commerce issue. Every day, an average of three trains derail in the U.S. and many of those trains are carrying hazardous waste materials that can be unleashed devastating consequences 
if the train goes off the track. We saw this last year in East Palestine, Ohio, when a train derailed with hazardous substances and led to evacuations and fear, not just East Palestine itself, but in towns around the incident in Ohio, as well as in Pennsylvania and beyond. The risk of these derailments should not be minimized. This is not only a community safety issue, we recognize that it's also an economic issue on those communities. Cities and towns that unfortunately have had derailments with hazardous materials are often left dealing with the consequences even a decade after the incident. Bearing the direct and indirect cost of having to drop everything else and deal with the derailments impact on the community's health, safety, and of course, the reputation. A derailment can be a devastating blow to a community. But under today's rules, the consequences are barely a dent in a railroad's profit. And that explains far too much. Safety is a shared responsibility, but it needs to be valued. Derailments are most often the result of inadequate maintenance and wear and tear, and they are almost entirely preventable. Every city along a rail line understands that rail policy made by Congress matters because every city knows that what happens in East Palestine or Paulsboro or Maryville could have just as easily happened in their community. Our city leaders have been raising concerns over rail policies for the past several years, and a rail safety issue have become more and more acute, whether it's blocking crossings, derailments, or a lack of responsiveness from railroad industry. NLC is here to work with you on this issue because it's important to every city, town, and the village in America. I'd like to thank the ranking members, Payne and Larson, for inviting cities to be at the table and to talk about the real impact, the real people that are taking their kids to school, families that are going to work because long uh, rail systems or waiting time, it is a real issue. So thank you all so much, and I appreciate the opportunity again to help create common sense bipartisan rail safety legislation. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, next, we will have uh, Vince Verna, Brotherhood of Locomotive Engineers. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Ranking Member Payne and uh, Ranking Member Larson and uh, distinguished uh, members of Congress here today for inviting uh, us to come and speak to you. Uh, my name is Vince Verna. I am the Vice President National Legislative Representative for the Brotherhood of Locomotive Engineers. I have 30 years in this industry. I'm also a locomotive engineer. Um, the members uh, that I represent, I'm very proud to be included as a member of this great union. Uh, and we operate America's uh, freight and passenger locomotives all throughout the country uh, every day. We are proud to keep this economy moving and this country running. Uh, I'm here today, unfortunately, to provide yet another warning about the dangers of congressional and regulatory inaction that our members witness on the railroads every day. The Wall Street-driven policies that the railroads adopted with precision. This way? Okay. The, rail, uh, the, the policies of, that were adopted with precision scheduled railroading um, have prioritized ever-increasing quarterly returns over the lives of workers, the communities they serve, and the environment. The issue of long trains uh, in the last 10 years, we have seen the length of freight trains increase big time. It is common to see 18 to 20,000 foot trains or longer. That is about four miles long. The average length of sidings and the infrastructure that these trains travel on is about 8,500 feet. This fosters many problems. These may include blocked crossings, increased in-train forces due to the greater lengths and weights, uh, risking further train derailments, and the severity of those derailments. Track conditions not dangerous with shorter trains can become so with trains over 8,500 feet. 
Uh, if you have a defect or, or unplanned event uh, three miles back in your train, it may take hours for a conductor to walk the length of the train and get back to the head end of the train. Um, those problems have to be identified before they can be addressed. On the issue of crew size, railroads have proposed reducing train crews to a single person. This would be a dangerous mistake. We know best, we run the trains. A certified locomotive engineer and certified conductor are essential to rail safety. They are the workers who solve unplanned problems and notify emergency services of accidents. They are the first on the scene of every accident and they have literal skin in the game. FRA has a rulemaking underway that we are eager to see, but a, leg a legislative mandate is still necessary. BLET asks Congress to formalize a two-person crew mandate so that future administrations cannot reverse safety gains by repealing a regulation. On the issue of C3RS, confidential close call reporting, it needs to be adopted by all of the class one railroads. More safety data will provide valuable lessons that we can all learn from. The airline version of this same program has led to 14 years without a death on a commercial airline in the United States, despite recent close calls in the airline industry. We would like to get just a single year with no deaths on the railroad. A single year record is needed before you can have a 14 year record like aviation has. No one should have to die at work. On the issue of precision scheduled railroading, we've all learned more about PSR than I think anyone really wants to know. Um, at the height, you know, th there was problems at the height of the pandemic when supply chains were strained because railroads had laid off over a third of their workforce, and this was before the pandemic started. This resulted in the inability to comply with their common carrier obligations. And while some of the most pressing issues of PSR have been addressed due to the increased reporting requirements from the STB, which we think should be made permanent, some railroads have begun returning to their anti-worker PSR playbook, including firing critical workers and then claiming they don't have the capacity to inspect and repair their trains. This puts locomotive engineers, conductors, other railroad workers, and the public in danger because our members, unfortunately, are instructed to operate trains that have known defects in too many cases. I would like to thank the committee for holding this round table. We endeavor to improve the lives and working conditions of all rail workers. And to your colleagues, in Congress who are not here today, please let them know that continued delay on rail safety legislation is not a harmless exercise. To oversight agencies putting deregulatory ideology over rail safety regulations only adds to the 1,000 derailment a year accident toll. The consequences witnessed in the derailment aftermaths like in East Palestine are right before our eyes and ears. We've learned the hard way that the wages of PSR are rail accidents. All for the want of a nail, as the proverb goes. Please pass much needed rail safety legislation, HR 1674 uh, and HR 5871. It will protect our members as well as our communities. Thank you very much for the opportunity to, to have this discussion with you today. Thank you, sir. Uh, next, we'll hear from Peter Kennedy. Uh, sheet metal, uh, air, rail, transportation, workers. Sir? Thank you, Ranking Members Payne, Larson, and the members of the subcommittee. My name is Peter Kennedy. I serve as the Smart Railroad Mechanical Department Director. I have over 20 years' experience in the railroad industry. Very proud. From small town Indiana, Walkerton, just outside South Bend, little railroad town, about half the size of East Palestine. Um, I represent mechanical department workers, people that perform inspections, service, maintenance, repair, work on locomotives. There are also seven other rail unions that represent mechanical department workers in this industry that perform similar types of work as well as rail car repairs. Everybody knows the story. Rail, rail safety has deteriorated under precision scheduled railroading, cost-cutting business model. And it's nothing more than a cost-cutting business operating model that is founded upon the root of all evil, which is the love of money. The sole focus is to maximize profits for shareholders, Wall Street activist investors, and a few top-ranking industry investors and executives. And profit maximization is accomplished through 
basically two methods, cuts and ignoring. In cutting services and ignoring common carrier obligations by only providing service to the most profitable and premium paying customers. Cutting equipment by using less locomotives and rail cars and creating Goliath-sized trains. Cutting services, maintenance, and repairs to equipment and ignoring FRA defects. And then the worst of all, as far as I'm concerned, is cutting railroad workers. The elimination of employees from this industry is nothing but of biblical proportions. Um, as Ben said, over 30% of the workforce has been el eliminated. With respect to the mechanical department employees, 41% of the workforce has been eliminated since PSR. And what's crazy are the cuts are still happening. Two weeks ago, BNSF announced the 362 mechanical department employee furloughs. It's absolutely asinine that they are furloughing people. Here's why. This is the second year in a row that BNSF has said that they could not perform minimum federally required inspections that are centered upon safety. What they did the last two years was blamed it on winter weather or they blamed it on inadequate workforce. This year was winter weather. Here's another problem with this. Winter storms are predictable. They happen every winter and the railroads control who they hire, right? But they're not hiring workers. They're cutting them. And I'm talking about employees with 10 to 12 years of service in this industry, just gone, just like that, wiped away from this industry, all that expertise. It's absolutely asinine. There's not enough workers to perform this critical safety work on locomotives and rail cars in this country. That's what it boils down to. Rail safety and services cannot be permitted to diminish any further. We have to start rebuilding somewhere. We urge legislators to pass the Railway Safety Act. Thank you. Thank you. Now we hear from Ms. Anna Savidel. Hello, uh, thank you, Congressman Larson and Maine and the esteemed members of the subcommittee for inviting me to this important discussion. As a small business owner from the heart of East Palestine, Ohio, I am here to convey my community's experience and shared resilience in the face of the significant disaster that impacted all of us. The Norfolk Southern train derailment in East Palestine on February 3rd, 2023 was more than just a tragic incident. It was a catastrophe that ruptured the fabric of our close-knit community. The event, a result of a disastrous and outdated railroad regulations that allowed corporations like Norfolk and Southern to act with little regard for the communities in their path don't just impact our town, it, de it devastated it. In East Palestine, where the spirit of America is deeply interwoven into every facet of our lives, the derailment wasn't merely an occurrence. It was a tragedy that resonated throughout every street and every home in our community. The immediate aftermath was marked by horrible shock. My niece, who was an, an integral of our family-run store, was forced to leave her family and driven away by the fears of their health and the environment in our town. The loss transcended significant financial implications it created a void in our family and community that no amount of revenue could ever fill. And our employees are not just a staff, but they're part of our extended community. We're, we're enveloped into the fear and anxiety of this occurrence. The absence reflected the broader emotional trauma inflicted on our entire community and the trauma still resonates. East Palestine is a town representative of America's resilient small town spirit, was plunged into an unsettling silence. The streets that once buzzed with the day-to-day -day activities of our close community fell quiet as many of our residents seeking safer envi environments chose to leave. The prolonged closure of the Taggart Street situation compounded this isolation. It disrupted not only our business operations, but our social fabric and def that defines our town. As 
as nationalist uh, attention shifted away from our community, we were left with the lingering sen sense of abandonment. Our once vibrant community spirit steeped into solidarity and mutual support has been replaced by collective sense of loss and uncertain future in our town. However, as time has progressed, while physical remnants of the derailment have faded, its impact lingers in the hearts, in the minds, and the livelihoods of those who remain. Adapting to this altered landscape is a testament to the, re the resilience and the determination of our community. But our struggle continues. Today, I stand before you not just as a small business owner, but as a voice for East Palestine. Our experience underscores the urgent need for the comprehensive rail safety standards, despite the profit-driven efforts of the railroad companies to prevent them. We advocate not just for our town, but for all the communities across the nation that are facing similar threats. We urge you to pass the comprehensive sale, uh, rail safety legislation, ensuring that what happened here in East Palestine does not reoccur elsewhere. Thank you very much for listening to our story for the recognizing the depth of our community's ordeal and for providing this opportunity to be a part of a meaningful change. Through this dialogue, we hope to transform the experience into a, a very much safer environment and more secure communities across our nation. Thank you very much. And thank you for being here and representing uh, small business owners that have been impacted uh, by these situations. Uh, now we will go into um, questions and I will recognize myself. Um, uh, Mr. Vernon, Mr. Kennedy, have your members uh, ever been told to release a train they knew was unsafe? Yes, um, thank you. Um, for the question. I, I think it happens too often in the rail industry where our members uh, are either instructed to take a train that, that they may have reported has some issue uh, for, for a variety of reasons uh, where they wanted to stop and inspect the train or they didn't, or in other cases where they just feel pressure uh, and have not been instructed, but they feel pressure they, they can't stop because they feel like it'll somehow result in some sort of uh, negative consequence for their employment. So there's a lot of pressure out there to keep the trains moving, uh, and that pressure exists for, for employees, it exists um, for management. Uh, and there's a real, real pressure to keep trains moving all the time. We're eager to move the freight. The people I represent, and I'm proud to represent, we're very eager to move the freight. We don't wanna slow trains down. That, that means it takes us longer to get where we're going. But Safety is always first and always has to remain first. And um, so there are unfortunately times where um, there's defects and that the defects are reported, but they're told to keep moving, unfortunately. So um, there's a constant pressure on them to keep the trains going. And they may not always ask directly, you know, damn that, just get it. But the pressure is there and you know that they want it moved. That, that's right. That's correct. Thanks. Mr. Kennedy? Absolutely. We've received numerous reports across all the crafts from our members that the railroads are literally telling them to ignore defects. When they report defects, managers are signing off on it, or as they like to say in the shops, pencil whipping reports that show that the trains are clear and good to go and leave the shop and that they're safe for going across these tracks through communities all across this country. And where, where can rail workers go? Uh, if they have safety concerns? Truth be told, they have a variety of options, but frankly, they don't really believe any of those options because what it happens is they end up getting railroaded. They end up losing their job, they lose their livelihood, and um, they are stuck waiting on a process to play out to uh, maintain their livelihood, and sometimes it doesn't work out that way. The, the railroads have a very rich history. Um, even though they describe themselves as very, uh, very, uh, 
Hagiographically, they are far from that. Um, they have a very rich history of just ruining the lives of employees who speak up. So there are ramifications for doing the right thing. There is nothing short of ramifications for doing the right thing in this industry. Thank you. Mr. Verner? Well, I, th I think that, you know, this pressure that I was talking about is really, really critical, and I think it really comes about as the result of precision scheduled railroading because the pressure is relentless from Wall Street to not just have a profitable quarter, but every quarter has to be more profitable than the last one. And that creates an enormous amount of downward pressure from the, from the high levels of management down all the way down to the, the members that I represent. And so, uh, but for us, um, like I mentioned, we have skin in the game and we're the first on the scene of every accident. So, you know, we have to look out a lot of times, I hate to say it, we have to look out for ourselves sometimes. And sometimes we need to make a stand when we see something that isn't safe, we have to stand up and say, look, this is not safe. And uh, we can't put ourselves at risk or put the public at risk. And uh, I'm, I'm just thrilled that we're having this discussion because we have not been able to, uh, to testify to the wider Congress about all the problems. And uh, I'm really happy that, that they're being highlighted Thank because you. we need some safe legislation passed. Thank you. Uh, now I yield to the gentleman from Washington, the ranking member of the TNI committee, Mr. Larson. Thank you, uh, Representative Payne. I just have a Two questions, uh, and the first one's for uh, Mayor uh, Moran from uh, Hiram, Georgia. Uh, I have a district that includes a lot of small towns as well. In fact, I jokingly say I'm the deputy mayor of all the small towns in my district because I've got so many of them. And uh, one of the concerns we've had over several years, of course, is the uh, rail safety and, and rail going through these towns. And one of the issues that comes up is the reliance on uh, and numbers of first responders. And I thought, Mayor Moran, you could help us understand how Hiram, Georgia sees the, um, um, uh, uh, see, sees a, your reliance on first responders in the event of a, a rail accident. Uh, do you have, do your first responders have the training? Do you have enough first responders uh, who are trained uh, in derailments and the potential of, uh, of chemicals or anything else being transported through your community? And, and what advice do you have for us on, on uh, how to help smaller towns like yours uh, address that issue? Well, we had some training uh, over at the, uh, our emergency operations center. A gentleman from Norfolk Southern came over and was talking about the, uh, the ask rail application. However, there was only uh, a limited amount of people at that training that training needs to be expanded to all of our first responder people. In Paulding County here, uh, we have a unified uh, fire system here. Uh, the Paulding County Fire Department covers the entire county. None of the cities have their own uh, fire departments. So it would be uh, relatively easy for them to do some training with the Paulding County Fire Department. And we have uh, a sheriff's office, city of Hiram Police Department, and city of Dallas, Georgia police officers, uh, police department. Uh, so it would be relatively easy to get those people together for some training. Yep, thanks. And uh, for Mr. Anthony, and then I'll turn it back over to the ranking member. Um, your folks sent a letter last year, included the uh, signatures of a couple of mayors in my district. Um, and one of the issues about, it was about the, uh, they raised the impact of long trains it's an issue that we are looking at in the Rail Safety Act. Can you talk a little bit about the NLC's view of long trains? Thank you for the question, of course. Um, as our members have been dealing with this issue, one of the major uh, challenges that they're having is that long trains are the reason, really, for the worst blockages in their communities. Um, it also impacts uh, our ability uh, to stop and provide services and ambulances, uh, police, uh, fire, it's just really dangerous. And what we've tried to do is sit down with the industry and to talk about how dangerous this is for our communities. And as you indicated, um, Member Larson, as a deputy mayor of all of these communities, <laughs> we need to be at the table. We need to talk about how this can be done 
in a more effective way. And so, yes, long trains are impactful. They're uh, destroying the opportunity for economic opportunities for many that live in the communities that uh, are local communities. Thanks. Uh, Mr. Ranking Member, I can't mind limit to a couple of questions. So I'm really uh, looking forward to hearing from the other members uh, who are here, and I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you, sir. And now we will hear from the gentlelady from Ohio, who um, part of her district and area has been impacted uh, in a great way, uh, Ms. Sykes. Thank you, Ranking Member Payne and Ranking Member Larson, Larson for letting me join this round table as a sort of member of the rail committee, but a member <laughs> of the full transportation committee and to our distinguished panel. I uh, appreciate your time and attention. Uh, to this matter. As we all know, the Norfolk Southern train derailment in East Palestine, Ohio, has upended the lives of many folks in Northeast Ohio, particularly in East Palestine. And while I don't directly represent East Palestine, we're about 30 miles to the west, uh, we know that the concern, the pollution, and the fear has no geographic boundaries. Um, and many of my first responders, the first responders in my community, sh showed up on the scene, and we were grateful uh, for their willingness to help their fellow Ohioan in need. In the years since the East Palestine train derailment, two additional trains have derailed in Ohio alone, many more across the country, and Americans across the political spectrum are concerned and continue to be concerned with the lack of action. I am proud that the Ohio Democrats and Republicans came together last year to introduce the Bipartisan Rail Act, and it's time for House Republicans and the majority to pass the Rail Act or some type of comprehensive rail safety le legislation in order to quell the fear that we hear from people all across the nation. Uh, the thing I will say before I get to my question is, there has been a complete lack and utter void of rail safety conversations here in the House. And the Americans who live near the 140,000 miles of railroad track are continuing to be concerned, and the majority is refusing to listen to those people. Nonetheless, we are listening, and thank you again to Ranking Members Payne and Larson to make sure that we had an opportunity to talk about rail safety in the United States House of Representatives. Uh, Ms. Sevi Doss, I want to turn my attention to you in the first question, uh, because Warden, I just want to thank you for speaking up for your community and for Ohioans and for folks across the country. It's not fair to you, and this is not right that you, would, you should have to do this, but I'm so grateful for you. And I didn't get a chance to meet you when I have visited on multiple occasions, but I did read about you in the New York Times. And one thing I wanted to understand is, do you feel that you were getting accurate information from Norfolk Southern? And could you also talk about how you felt about the resources and information you were getting from the state and federal government? Yes, sir. no, um, the information is not consistent uh, with Norfolk and Southern. We're not getting enough of it. At the moment, I haven't talked to anyone in over six months, so I can't give the, the things up. And as far as um, the resources from the federal and the state, I, I don't know of any resources from federal. Uh, statewide, I, I think they're trying to help us with regards to some information and some low interest or no interest loans for the for the city for uh, businesses, which are just about impossible to get, but I'm working on it, trying to keep everything open for our community because I think as a service to our you know population and everyone that lives here and relies on us, it's important for me to be here and service the community. I've been here for 23 years and I have no intention of leaving or shutting it down. So that's that's where I'm at. Thank you for that. And I know that you don't currently have a member of Congress representing you, but that should change soon. But if you or anyone in the area needs anything from the federal government, please do not hesitate to reach out to my office. We are here to help. Uh, I do want to bring to our attention also that last month in a Senate hearing, uh, it was revealed that the controlled burn that happened in East Palestine was unnecessary. And if I can recall from my recollection at the time, it was uh, chaos chaos between the multiple agencies trying to figure out what to do. Uh, Mr. Anthony, one of the provisions in the Rail Act was due to some suggestions from our governor about being able to communicate best 
with governments so that they can best make decisions. Uh, if you could talk about your communication lines or the communication lines of the members that you serve and how can they and could they be improved with the class one railroads. Thank you very much for the question. Um, you know, in our letter that we sent, we talked about the expectation of the industry being a good neighbor. And when we visualize a good neighbor, that means that you communicate with your neighbor. You schedule meetings to talk about the impact that you're having, whether it's your yard and their yard. Um, we are not getting that ability to be uh, considered a good neighbor. We're not being uh, communicated with on a consistent basis about the impact it has on our communities that is along the rail systems. And we understand that you know, the basic standards of being a good neighbor and communicating uh, would be to set up um, a communication system so that you alert the uh, residents of that community about uh, derailment and the hazardous waste that may be on the uh, trains. We don't have basic consideration at this time, and all we're asking for is for them to be a good neighbor and to include local government into the process, including the economic opportunities that should exist in the industry, jobs, and uh, other business uh, considerations. So, uh, Ms. Sykes, that's not happening now, and we really, really need that to happen in the adoption of this legislation. Thank you. Thank you, and I know I don't have any more time for questions, but I do want to note that there are multiple pieces of rail safety legislation, and none of them have been endorsed by the railroad industry, even with varying uh, degrees of enforcement. So I think that is very telling and very problematic for all of us. Thank you, gentlelady. Uh, now we will hear from a uh, gentleman from Massachusetts, uh, uh, my hero, uh, Mr. Malton. I don't know about that, but Mr. Payne, thank you very much. And thank you so much for your leadership in, in, in bringing us together. And thank you to our uh, witnesses um, for sharing your stories and um, for uh, being a part of trying to, to fix this situation. Mr. Vermer, you said in, um, in your comments that nobody should have to die at work. That's something that everybody should agree with, whether you're in the railroad industry, in the unions, Democrat or Republican, I think we should all agree with that. And I have been particularly concerned, as you have, about um, precision scheduled railing, uh, railroading. And you and uh, Mr. Kennedy spoke about this, how uh, the trains are getting much longer. This is very good um, for lowering operating ratios and making it efficient. It's actually not great for attracting more traffic. They're often just taking the most efficient traffic and moving it in the longest possible trains, but it reduces the quality of service. So some shippers move away from the railroads because of PSR, and therefore railroad share of the market actually goes down. And that gets to, I think, a really important point that we have to consider at this, at this hearing, which is that if the result of this discussion is that at the end of the day, we overregulate the railroads and we push more traffic to trucks, America will be a much less safe country. And we've gotta, we've gotta bear that in mind. You know, the ranking member talked about the grade crossing accidents uh, in his state in Washington. There are 78 uh, tragic deaths due to grade crossing accidents. Not, those are usually not the railroad's fault. Almost 99% of the case it has no fault to the railroad. It's people violating traffic laws or, um, or dying by suicide. In that same year, there were 772 deaths in Washington due to motor vehicle accidents. Uh, Mr. Anthony, you talked about how three trains per day derail across America. Three trains today, per day is, is three too many, but every single day there are between 17 and 20,000 motor vehicle accidents across America. 17 to 20,000, 117 of them fatal on average. The horrific tragedy in East Palestine, of course, resulted in zero deaths. And if you look at hazmat by rail, for the decade starting in 2020, uh, in 2012, the, the latest uh, years for which I have numbers, there were 71 highway deaths due to hazardous materials transportation, exactly zero on the railroads. In 2021, 
there were 391 rail incidents involving hazmat, zero deaths. On the highways, 22,831. So, look, I don't want kids walking to school and being stuck behind a long freight train, but if you took every car on that freight train and put it in a truck on the, on the road, kids would be dying walking to school. And I think that's a really important perspective that we have as we all try to find a way to get better rail safety. Mr. Verma, I agree with your goal. There should be zero accidents. We should have a modernized rail system that has the same goal of the air industry of, the air industry of having zero accidents and, and indeed recording close calls and, and, and whatnot. I think the push for rail safety, therefore, has to be modern rail safety. When were wayside detectors developed, Mr. Verma? I'm not sure the exact year that wayside detectors were 1960s. It's 1960s technology when, when a lot of railroads were still run by telegraph. We're not pushing the railroads to install more telegraphs, right? Um, Mr. Kennedy, do your workers on trains get real-time information from cars, uh, uh, the defects and whatnot today? No, so the, no, they don't. The members that I represent work in the shop. No, and, 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 and Mr. Verma, certainly your engineers do not get real-time information about a car defects on the locomotives. Well, that's not entirely right, Congressman. Some, there are some defects that, that notify them as soon as they finish traveling over the detector. Some hotbox detectors will broadcast on the radio and so you hear about, and so you'll hear about some certain uh, defects. But if every car had sensors that would in real time report not just when a hotbox detector trips, but the actual temperature of every axle, that would be transformative. That's, that's 2020s technology, not 1960s technology. So the final point I wanna make is that as we consider rail safety legislation, um, Mr. Chairman, I hope we really think about how we can modernize the rail industry. Not just put a few more hot box detectors in, which are 1960s technology, but really have a goal of zero accidents, which you're only gonna get with 2020s technology. We're all walking around with all kinds of sensors on our body right now. There's no reason why the rail industry who didn't have those sensors on four axles per rail car. That would give real-time information to engineers and we could truly achieve zero deaths. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, now we will hear from the gentlelady from Oregon, Ms. Hoya, who we are working on a project together at Coos Bay. But yes, we another, are, so that we can day. have uh, port to rail uh, transport. But um, my question is based on what I've heard from a number of locomotive engineers um, from my district for a long time. We have longer trains, and in Oregon we have frontier areas that have pretty extreme weather, and we also have very populated areas. Um, and given that there is, and you alluded to this, Mr. Verna, there is no um, uh, minimum crew requirements. The Federal Ra Railroad Administration has proposed a two-person minimum crew, but it's a proposal. We have a bill for that, but we haven't seen it move. Can you explain what happens when there is a problem with the tracks, when there is a mechanical problem with the train, or when there is a health issue or situation um, in a, uh, with a locomotive engineer um, on a one-person crew on one of these very long trains? Well, most trains have two people on the crew right now, and, I, and I'm familiar with being part of a two-person crew. So what I can talk about directly is the advantages of having two people on the crew, uh, moreover than the disadvantages of having a single person. So what I would say is that having a second person in the cab with the locomotive engineer is, is essential because that person is the only crew, member of the crew who is mobile. Anytime there is an accident or, or an unplanned event, everything you're talking about are unplanned events. And I wish unplanned events didn't happen when you go on duty uh, at, at the railroad, but every day someone goes on duty, there's an unplanned event. Most of the time they're minor. Uh, most of the time, everyone gets there safely, as, Mr. as Congressman Moulton tested. The railroad is a safer industry than, than being on the highway, statistically. And, uh, and, and I'm a, a beneficiary of the safety that is on the railroads currently. And so are our fellow members, and we're happy about that. But 
Things like a train can break in two. Uh, that means the knuckles that hold the train together can sometimes break, and the more weight and more length and the more improperly a train is built when it leaves, the more likely you're going to have those in-train forces I testified about that could make a train break in two. When that happens, the train stops automatically because there's a, the, when the air hoses break, it puts the brake, train brakes on. Somebody has to get off that train and go find where the train broke. We hope it broke within the first five or 10 cars so it's easy to fix. But on a three to four mile train, if it broke on the, on the last 10 cars, you're gonna, uh, if the conductor gets off, he's gonna have quite a hike and it's not gonna be on always the best day at the best time of day on a well-paved sidewalk. It's gonna be on ballast, uneven footing, in the rain, in the snow, in all hours of the day and night. And it's gonna take quite a bit of time to just, just to find the problem. If there's an accident at a grade crossing, where, um, where un unfortunately we have way too many of those, where, where uh, people are hit who are in a car who run around the gate. Most of the time, like and again, Congressman Moulton said, most of the time it it's, has nothing to do with the railroad or the train crew or anything. The motorist decided to go around the gates. That's the biggest problem that we have. However, having been involved in those, having been involved in uh, having a pedestrian commit suicide in front of my train, I'm very well aware of, of, of all of the things that I didn't get into that are, that are terrible to have to live with as a locomotive engineer. But, but having that second crew member as somebody who can get off the train and go find something, who can go check on uh, the motorist who got hit by the train and see, is, gosh, is everybody in the car alive? There were, there were children in the car. Are they alive? Are they okay? They're the first people to call uh, the ambulance to say, we've got people, we've got problems here. If, if it were just me in the cab as the locomotive engineer without a team, teammate there, a conductor, I, I would have to stay with the train. I can't just get off whenever I want and leave the train unattended. I have to stay with it uh, because of, for, for all kinds of safety reasons. So I, I hope that helps to, to with, with your understanding. That does. So I think Mr. Verna and um, certainly Mr. Kennedy, you alluded to this as well. Be fair to say that if we're looking for to advise the railroads on where to cut costs or where to find ways to increase profit, cutting in areas of experienced critical staff is probably not where we should go. Yeah? 100% correct. And if I may, there's nowhere left to cut. Thank you. Uh, now we're here for the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Deluzio. Ranking Member Payne, thank you for inviting me. Ranking Member Larson as well. I'm not a member of the Transportation Infrastructure Committee, so I very much appreciate uh, your leadership here of calling this meeting and bringing attention to rail safety, which we badly need. Uh, I have the great honor of representing Pennsylvania 17th District, Western Pennsylvania, uh, my constituents uh, across the border from East Palestine and Beaver County, and Darlington Township and surrounding communities, of course, live through the, uh, live through the East Palestine derailment. Uh, my State of the Union guest just last week, uh, township supervisor from Darlington who led his community through that day and the months and now year plus to follow. Uh, I'm, I'm proud to have the Railway Safety Act and appreciate the kind words uh, on the bill. Uh, Mr. Anthony, I'm going to come back to something that you and Ranking Member Larson uh, and Mayor Hiram as well were talking about, which is first responders um, and the costs of dealing with these derailments. Uh, Mr. Fitzpatrick from Pennsylvania, my colleague, and I have a bill, uh, H.R. 2999, Assistance for Local Heroes During Train Crises Act, which tells the class-run railroads to pay into a fund to reimburse first responders for dealing with derailments. I think it's a, a problem for so many small communities and big communities across the country to be stuck with the bill, so I appreciate the attention there. I want to thank uh, Mr. Kennedy and Mr. Verna. The word coming out of your members about safety and what you see uh, every day, your members see every day working on rail safety. And uh, I want to come back to what Ms. Sykes brought up, the NTSB chair's testimony uh, in front of the Senate, which I found to be shocking. Uh, the implication was clear that the vent and burn 
was not necessary, that Norfolk Southern pursued their profit, their eagerness to get their tracks open, to get their trains moving at the expense of my constituents and many others. And so I ask a simple question. I'll start with you, Mr. Kennedy. Do you trust the railroads to regulate themselves? Absolutely not, because if they did, they would have handled business already, uh, not waited 13 months and continue to have these types of hearings, sir. Yeah. Mr. Verna, what do you think? I would echo that. They've had, they've had nothing but opportunities to regulate themselves, and, and the status quo will not suffice here. There, there needs to be some changes to, to get at people that stubbornly, um, I hate to say it, and, and, and Congressman Moulton quoted me as saying, no one should die at work. Accident trends have been and going you know, down over the many years, but you know, the stubborn trend is that people are still dying at work. Yeah. And I just want to get a year where we have zero deaths and I'm so passionate about that because we've been close before, and I want to get to a year where we have zero deaths so we can start setting records for years where we've had zero deaths. I really want to be, uh, be, be part of that industry, and I want to work with the railroads and, and Congress and FRA to, to achieve those ends. Yeah. Surprise, I don't trust them either. I think we need meaningful legislation. To my friend Mr. Moulton's point, uh, those kinds of issues around whether we should change something or have a better technology, that's what we do in a hearing and a markup, which I think the message to our Republican counterparts is clear. Let's move this legislation. Let's give folks a chance to vote on it and protect communities like mine. So thank you, Ranking Member Payne and Larson, uh, for including me today, and thank you for doing this. Thank you for being here. And um, just want to acknowledge the um, gentleman from California, Mr. Desanye, who has uh, joined us to um, listen to um, the uh, information that we are disseminating. I will um, recognize the um, ranking member of TNI, Mr. Larson. Just a few more, <clears throat> a few more, just a few more questions, if you don't mind. Uh, I want to ask uh, um, Ms. Uh, Ms. Sevi Das from, from East Palestine, Ohio, as we move forward uh, and hopefully move forward, uh, on legislation is, are there one or two things that you want to see in a rail safety bill? More, uh, we would like to see more hot clock detectors. And the trains are so long, so long. Something's gotta be done about all of this. very unsafe for the community. Yeah. Thank you, thank you. And then um, I don't want to let uh, um, the mayor go without asking him, Is there are there one or two things specifically you'd like to see in a rail safety bill? Yeah, I would. Yeah. I would, sir. Thank you for the question. Uh, they're looking at going to more artificial intelligence to do uh, uh, infrastructure checks along the lines. I, in, that is, technology is fine, but you really need a set of eyes down there to take a look at the rails uh, to be inspected. You can't rely uh, completely on uh, artificial intelligence to do something like that. Uh, the other thing is, uh, when these freight trains block the uh, intersections in our cities, it happens our police and uh, fire response uh, and ambulance calls get, for getting through, and it also limits our downtown businesses uh, for conducting business during that time. And sometimes, well, we came when I came in this afternoon, there was one block in our uh, intersection downtown today. Uh, and co consequently, when they're out, out there, sometimes they're there for two or three days at a time. I think you think it's stop a little bit short or go past the... Uh, intersection, I think that would be a great thing. But again, I, I just want to say that uh, you need uh, eyes on for inspections on the train tracks. Yeah, thanks, thanks. And then um, I noted in my opening statement, the NTSB has 190 recommendations outstanding even before we get the report, uh, presumably in the middle of June. Um, been a lot of commitments to have a hearing, just merely a hearing, after the NTSB report comes out. I'd certainly like to see us move on actual legislation here in the House of Representatives. 
Uh, Mr. Kennedy, I have a challenge for you. Uh, of the 190 outstanding rail safety recommendations, do you have two on that list from the NTSB? That, uh, so just one, uh, to do quick math, 195th of the uh, recommendations. I don't, I apologize. I'd have to review it again. <laughs> okay. Ms. Verna? Well, I'm happy to say that the BLET um, has, uh, is a stakeholder uh, with our um, uh, safety task force, and we're a stakeholder with the NTSB involved in the investigation. So I'm, uh, I'm eager that uh, as the report gets finished, we will ha also have an opportunity to weigh in with NTSB uh, and, and the public with our, our own recommendations, uh, having been involved as part of the investigation. Um, you know, one of the things that we're looking at is with, with detectors, for instance, um, is that it's not just how, many, how often you space a detector, is that these detectors need standards. They have to be, right now, the, they can be pulled in and out of service almost at will by the railroads uh, whenever they want them. And sometimes they're used almost as if they're toys because they're, the standards need to be there about what they detect, what, what sorts of uh, uh, problems they detect, different types of detectors, high wide detectors, hot box detectors, dragging equipment detectors. And so, and the crews on the trains need to be empowered that when those detectors go off and tell them you have a defect on your train, that they don't just have to keep going uh, till the next, till the next, till it's convenient to stop uh, for for business purposes. They need to be able to stop as soon as they safely can get that train stopped and inspect that train. Yeah. Thanks, um, and Mr. Uh, Anthony, I want to be fair to you and ask you if there's one or two things that are outstanding that you haven't mentioned. Uh, I would I would say that uh, the cost of the responders, the impact on the local uh, community, um, also um, a requirement to communicate and strategize and plan uh, with the local community that has been impacted. And as Mr. Moulton indicated, that uh, the systems hadn't been updated since 1960s. This is what that bill this bill does. It brings us in, into a modern time of coordination and response. It's been too long of a history where the industry has gone into communities and broke up communities, impacted our planning of our community systems, the environmental air impact on uh, minority communities throughout America has been um, acknowledged. Um, I just think it's time that uh, they be good neighbors and communicate with our local leaders who are leading their communities. Thank okay. you for the question. Yeah, thank you. Uh, back to you, uh, Mr. Payne, Representative Payne. Thank you very much. Um, let's see. Um, did you have, no? Okay. Um, Norfolk Southern recently committed to joining a pilot program of the confidential close call reporting system that several short lines in Amtrak already participate in. Why do you think there is a delay in the um, other railroads joining? Mr. Vernon? Well, um, I don't speak for the other railroads. Um, I, I'm eager to have all of the class one railroads be part of the confidential close call reporting system. I, I believe in it. I was at the first meeting. Uh, I'm, I'm a little sad to say I was at the first meeting for close call reporting in 2003. Um, and we still don't have a reporting system today. Uh, I'm very happy and, and uh, told uh, Norfolk Southern so that they've agreed to be part of a pilot program. Uh, to gather uh, safety statistics for close calls. Uh, I'm thrilled, actually, to see it happen, and I'm, I want to be part of it when the other railroads join in uh, so we can get more data. The more data we have on close calls, the more we can understand the precursors that go into accidents that, that convert from a close call to a full-blown accident. And you only have to see one of the East Palestines that go, we don't want that to ever happen again. Right. So. Mr. Kennedy? Well, I, th I think uh, I made this comment a, about a month ago in a, another meeting, and in, it involved a, a railroad corporate representative. And a lot of the comment was focused on from the railroad side that they didn't want to sign up for the 
C3RS program because they were worried about workers abusing it. And my response to that was, it's pretty shameful that you start from the premise that your employees are habitual offenders of safety. That in other words, they come to work to violate rules and get hurt. That is utterly ridiculous. And if I may comment on that a little further, mm -hmm. when we went to the BNSF locations last week, particularly in rural Nebraska, we had members talk to us about safety issues. And one member individual said something very powerful. He said, I felt like I won the lottery when I got a job on the railroad. I was a millionaire is what it felt like. And other workers said, but now every day we are gambling with our lives with the practices that are in place because of this cost cutting business model. That is so saddening to hear that, that the railroads view their employees as so despicable that they would intentionally abuse a system that protects them, that improves safety in this industry. That's not the purpose of that system. No further comment. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, recently, I've noticed uh, an increased level of activity by hedge funds into the operations of railroads. Uh, who do you believe has more expertise on rail safety, the labor that operates and maintains rail cars or the hedge fund managers? Mr. Would you have an opinion on that? Uh, my educated uh, guess would be the, the rail managers, but probably Mr. Uh, member. Mr. Vernon? Well, as I said before, the expertise of uh, locomotive engineers and certified locomotive uh, conductor or conductors in the CAVA train, we're the experts. We're out there every day. Uh, I'll let hedge fund experts be the, the, the experts in business matters on Wall Street, but leave the railroading to us. Okay. Thank you. Ms. Kennedy? Undoubtedly, it's the skilled workers that do the work every day. Um, this makes me think of a, a funny saying that Warren Buffett has been attributed to saying, which is, you know, you cannot have a baby in one month by getting nine people pregnant. Well, by the same token, you can't replace skilled workers um, by the stroke of a pen and trying to hire them after you eliminate them, especially when they have 10, 12 years of experience. It takes years to develop that experience. And the railroads, frankly, exploit loopholes that exist in the regulations now to try and pretend that they have experts in the field um, with regards to management, and they don't. The real experts are the people that do it day in, day out, and they do it with pride, and they do it as safely as possible. Thank you. Um, Ms. Uh, Sevidos, uh, Norfolk yes. Southern has publicly committed, as they say, making it right, their words. What does making it right mean to you? Well, um, we want... We would like East Palestine to be made whole again. It's very important to the community and uh, rail safety bill to be passed. That would help. Uh, and uh, media monitoring, uh, medical monitoring, excuse me, in the future for all the residents and the people exposed to the contamination. That would be something we would say at least 20 to 30 years on that, not sure. Uh, and that the railroad would be held accountable for all of this since it all stems from them. Thank you. Well, I'd like to um, thank all of the um, people on the panel for joining us for this very important topic. It's unfortunate that my colleagues on the other side of the aisle uh, seem not to be able to understand um, why this is so important. Um, to think the tragedy that you could have with one man trains is unconscionable. To ask one person to be responsible for a train of that length and as you stated, 
they're not walking down the sidewalk. They're unstable footing. Suppose he slips and falls and hits his head on a rock or on the, on the rail or anywhere and then just lies there until somebody figures out that, you know, something must be wrong. I mean, just for that reason alone, to propose this is unconscionable. I mean, are your stakeholders uh, that important? I mean, to raise the profits. I mean, to record numbers already. And not think of the people that are allowing you to benefit from those profits? It's the workers. They're the ones getting the commodity there. They're the ones working those late hours. And so, um, yeah, I will continue to fight. I'm not, I'm not done yet. I'm not resting until we can basically uh, get them to listen. And we will continue to raise the issue. If they have to be embarrassed into it, then we will. But there's no reason that my colleagues on the other side of the aisle just have a total disregard for safety. When in so many other instances, they fight for safety. Need to be safe, so I need to, well, that's a, for another day. But um, I just want to thank all of you for being here. We would definitely be reaching out uh, to you for um, consulting and information. And um, we will call this roundtable adjourned. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Perfect.